All right, for part five, we're going to talk about tornadoes and how to properly observe uh, tornadoes, some of the different cloud formations that are associated with tornadoes. With, with this, the, the spotters that have historically been involved with the Weather Service and Skywarn and being able to report to us, for tornadoes, it's been something that's provided an extra level of support for us in terms of getting that information. It's a little bit easier with damaging winds or hail where you can just measure what happened. The, the hailstone occurred, you measure it, and anybody can pretty much do that. Same thing with like tree damage. But with tornadoes, it's a little bit more difficult and it can be a little bit more tricky because you're kind of relying on cloud formations. You're trying to figure out what is actually happening and how to report this to the weather service. So that's why we spend a lot of time talking about tornadoes and some of the clouds that are associated with it because it is a little bit trickier. And this really helps us out uh, in order to get that warning information to people as soon as we possibly can. So with tornadoes, they're, they're rated by the damage that they do, and it goes from zero to five on the, it's the Fujita scale. A couple year, number of years ago, it got re, reworked uh, with the wind speeds based on the damage that can occur and uh, kind of revamped the whole scale so that it's called the enhanced Fujita scale now. But from the zero all the way up to the five, most common tornadoes are the zeros and ones. And thankfully, there aren't a whole lot of fatalities or injuries that occur with those tornadoes. We have seen fatalities occur from EF1 level tornadoes with mobile home parks and manufacturer housing. So um, know that in those weaker tornadoes, you can still have some injuries and fatalities that occur. The ones that are the, the higher on the scale, anything essentially a two or above is when you're really going to start seeing some issues with, um, you know, more injuries and fatalities. It's been a while since we've had those levels of tornadoes here in Wisconsin. And we have some concern that people are going to be complacent when it comes to knowing that those types of tornadoes happen here in Wisconsin. So those especially are the ones that we need to be able to forewarn people about and make sure that they can get to their shelter in time. So uh, if you're reading, if you're watching this after April, uh, this arrow might be a little bit further down the scale here. But regardless, by the time you're watching this, hopefully it's at the beginning of the severe weather season here in Wisconsin, where we've had kind of a slow start to it. But typically by the time you get through June and July is when you have the most active severe weather in the state. So here's just the scale of the tornadoes that we've documented going back to 1950. Most of these happen in June, but uh, you can pretty much get them any time of year if the right weather conditions come together. Peak time for those tornadoes, too, is between 3 and 9 o'clock in the evening. But again, those can happen any time of the day. Some of our worst tornadoes are the ones that occur overnight when people are sleeping or maybe don't aren't paying attention to the weather as much as what they might be doing during the day when there's sunlight. So with tornadoes, some of the things to look for is there debris at the base of uh, where the rotation is. So in this case, this is the initial development of the Oakfield tornado from Kaylin Lloyd. And you kind of make it out in this picture here on the horizon. There's some dust kind of getting kicked up here. That means that, that circulation from the storm is making it down to the ground. So that technically at that point is considered to be a tornado. So if it's in contact with the ground, we consider it to be a tornado. If it's not, say you have this circulation up at the base of the cloud, but you're not seeing any of that debris or any sort of condensation funnel making it all the way down to the ground, that would be considered a funnel cloud instead of a tornado. So if you're reporting that to our office, know the difference between the two so that you can keep those straight when you're, when you're reporting them. Power flashes might be another a signature of uh, what you're seeing with a tornado that's basically power lines that are getting pulled out of the transformers could be that there's a tree that's fallen onto the power lines sometimes that can happen with straight line winds as well so it's not just two tornadoes where we see that there are some clouds that might be a precursor to a tornado not necessarily but wall clouds which we'll talk about a little bit this whole thing underneath here would be considered a wall cloud this is an isolated lowering typically in the south-southwest side of the storm that you can monitor for potential tornado development. 
And then funnel cloud. So again, funnel cloud would be where you have this rotation here, but maybe it's not coming in contact with the ground yet. So here you can kind of see it, the condensation funnel is getting closer and closer to the ground. Uh, if you go from that last picture to this one, same thing with the debris getting kicked up there. It might look like the condensation funnel is not all the way down to the ground, but the winds associated with that tornado are making it all the way down there. The whole part of this uh, going from kind of the edge here to the other edge would likely be your wall cloud. So that whole thing would be rotating around. It's the updraft part of the thunderstorm. So the air is going up into the thunderstorm here in this lo location. And when there's enough wind shear, you get this uh, <clears throat> these rotating winds that can start developing with the wall cloud itself and then eventually a tornado. So as we talk about the wall clouds, again, this is an isolated lowering. The difference between this and the shelf cloud, that shelf cloud is that long cloud that's along the horizon that is moving away from the thunderstorm. So basically that's the first thing that comes through. And then there's a wind gust and then probably some rain behind it as well. Wall clouds is an isolated lowering. So not as it's not gonna be all the way around the horizon. It's just gonna be this, uh, this one lone cloud that's kind of hanging on the bottom side of the thunderstorm. And it's typically gonna be in the, the rain-free area. So the, the southwest rear portion of the storm so that you can clearly see where it is as opposed, you know, with that shelf cloud that's going to be on the leading edge and then moving away, or moving towards you or away from where the rainfall is. Is it persistent? Is there any kind of rotation to it? Some of the things you can do is just watch it and watch for the, on the front side of it. Are you seeing a cloud? Are the, is it moving from left to right on the front side, right to left on the back? Um, just because there's some movement to it does not mean that there's rotation with it, but uh, that's something that you have to kind of sit there and watch it for a bit and see what's going to happen. And having a wall cloud does not always mean we're going to get a tornado. I think the, the research is somewhere around 20% of storms that develop a wall cloud will have a tornado that forms with it. It really depends on the environment that is associated with that storm. If it's way north of where the warm front is and it's got a lot of stable air underneath it, you can get a wall cloud and a, a very strong, severe thunderstorm, but it might be more of a, a large hail producer than a tornado that uh, maybe can't get down to the ground. So you can report these to us. So please, if you have a wall cloud, uh, to send a picture and let us know what you're seeing there. Funnel clouds, again, not in contact with the ground. Here's kind of an older picture here, but uh, rotating uh, kind of a needle looking type cloud here, a little bit of condensation with that, but it's not in contact with the ground, but it's got a strong rotation with it. There are times when you can report nothing is happening with the storm. So say that you're on a, a tornado worn storm and you're in this kind of ideal location, kind of on the south, southeast side of the storm, and maybe you do see a wall cloud or maybe there's you know nothing happening there that's an okay thing to report to us. You can say, hey, I'm southeast of the storm here. I'm, I'm not seeing any sort of rotation or a wall cloud. Maybe it's very high based. You can, you can report on that. That's kind of a, a nothing report as opposed to reporting that, hey, there's a tornado that's, that's on the ground here. Is this a, an area where, you know, maybe there's a funnel cloud could potentially develop? Maybe. Um, just us knowing that there's somebody there that uh, we can kind of, uh, touch base with or know that somebody's underneath it watching it that as soon as they do see something change they'll they'll call and report it to us. Nighttime tornadoes can be a, a very difficult thing to kind of point out uh, really relying on like backlit lightning or power flashes to tell you where a tornado actually is. Uh, it can be very dangerous to try to spot these at night uh, because you're really relying on that lightning and uh, the, the light flashes to be able to show you where that tornado might be. So uh, some people that do spot these at night, they use radar support to kind of see where they are in relation to where the storm is. But again, very kind of tricky situation to try to report on uh, when it comes to tornadoes. There are some things that might trip people up when it comes to uh, kind of tornado or funnel cloud lookalikes. Rain shafts, uh, this is just like maybe a, a scattered shower or thunderstorm here where all of a sudden all the rain starts coming out and you kind of see along the sides where 
it, it maybe looks like it's kind of a dark cloud coming down to the ground, but that's actually just rain that's coming out of out of the, the storm there, the rain shower. So you, if you're a trained spotter, you'd be watching that, kind of watching it for if there's rotation with that or not, or if it's just, you know, rain coming down to the ground. Virga is rain that's drying up before it gets to the ground. So you kind of see these kind of wispy, kind of finger-like things coming out of the bottom of the cloud base here. That's just Virga. That's uh, rain that's coming out of the cloud, but it's very dry below it. And it actually dries it up before it can actually get down to the ground. So um, that's uh, we've had a lot of people report those as funnel clouds or something like that where it uh, actually is not. More uh, funnel cloud kind of look like as uh, scud clouds. So typically on the, the underside of a squall line, uh, when you have like a big long line of a shelf cloud, you can sometimes get these low hanging scud clouds as well, where it's just uh, kind of an ominous looking low hanging cloud, but there's no rotation to it. It's just kind of drifting along and it can look bad because it's so low to the ground and typically it's kind of dark and uh, moving upwards that people will call this in as a funnel cloud. So again, uh, know the difference between what a scud cloud looks like. Again, the more that you go out and you spot and look at this stuff, you, you'd have a good idea that, oh, that's just a, a scud cloud as opposed to, oh, this is, this is actually a funnel cloud. This is legit. So with safety, when it comes to, um, to this, the important thing is to have a plan ahead of time. You know, where's the safe place to go to when there's a tornado? If you've got a basement, that's a safe spot to go to. If you don't have a basement, just trying to put as many walls between you and the outside as possible is important. Um, staying away from windows, things like that. The Some of the bonuses on maybe the high-end type tornado days is to put on shoes and boots. If your house gets hit by the tornado, you want to have shoes on so that if you if you have to leave the house, you don't have to walk through a minefield of glass and uh, debris and all this other stuff. If, you're, if your house gets wiped away from the foundation, you won't be able to find shoes or anything like that after it goes through. So um, something to consider having in your, your shelter. Getting under a table is a bonus. If anything falls into the basement or in your spot, That'll kind of take a lot of the pressure of uh, anything collapsing in on that space. And having pillows or a blanket can kind of help with blocking that debris that's flying around. Extra bonus would be putting on a helmet, too, to protect your head if anything falls in on the house as well. A couple examples, some pictures of some of the tornado damage from last year in uh, the Tennessee area. Kind of why you want to don't you don't want to be in the top level of a house. First thing that typically goes is the roof when a tornado hits it, and you can have debris flying in, or all, all of a sudden you're going to be exposed to anything that's happening there. So lowest level of the house is the safest if you can if you can get there or an interior room. So this kid came home from school and a tornado hit his house down in Oklahoma, and he didn't have a basement, so he went to the bathroom in the middle part. So typically. First thing that goes is the roof. The next thing are the exterior walls. And then if it's bad enough, it would be the interior part of the, the house. So if you are in the bathroom, that's a good spot to, to kind of get down and, and hunker down for when the, that tornado does come through. 